worship. It makes it an avenue, a petri dish, so to speak, of where God can start talking to you. And he has something to say through what he says. Now, he's not asking you to do everything in this book. There's a lot of stuff in here he has the church to do. But everything in this book, the church is responsible for. He's asking the church to do it. See, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not an apostle. I haven't started a church. I prophesy from time to time, but I'm not a prophet. So things that, are in, <clears throat> things that are in here are not necessarily everything that you're responsible for, but there are things that you are responsible for. That's what you need to find out. And you get that by spending that time with the Father, and you praise and worship him in the mornings with just you and him. So you don't have outside things going on, and you're looking at things, and you're hearing things, and, and, and your mind isn't on what you're not on hearing him. And listening to him. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. That's in the quiet place. That's in a one and one And you know, we're so busy, 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 busy. You don't want to sit down and just let God talk to you. You're going to let him talk to you as you've got your plans for the day and you're going to do your thing. And you aren't listening very well because you've got your own agenda. I've experienced that many times. I mean, he's not sending you to hell for this. He's just, you're just not going to get there. I'm not here. I'm not an evangelist. I'll lead people to the Lord. I'll help them get born again, tell them how. But that's not, that's not my calling. Okay? And so... I have a calling to perfect the body of Christ. You understand? I'm not here to get people born again. Love to see that. Okay? But that's what all you hear in some churches. Just a constant every Sunday, every Wednesday, pounding and pounding and pounding to people. Yeah, you got to get born again. You got to. And, and, and really, that's the time. To allow the gifts in the body of Christ to do their thing. The pastor needs to get out of the way and let the teachers, let the evangelists, let the prophet, let them do their job. Let them be a part of this body that's, that, that, that's there. Because the pastor isn't everything. He does not have all the gifts. Never met one that did. So you need to find out what part you play in the kingdom of God. Maybe several things. I heard one gentleman say, I think everybody has three gifts. I have no clue where I come up with that, but that doesn't mean you can't. I don't know. But you can't ask him. You know, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that you ask God for gifts. It says he places in the church. He gives the gifts. And then the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. They'll never be taken back. You go to the grave with it. If you've never used it, you still take it to the grave. And one day you're going to stand before him. You know the weeping and the crying it talks about? You're going to sit there and see all the things you could have done and all the people that you could have helped and you didn't. And you're going to weep and it's going to be a tough situation. Now once you get into heaven, what you do here will have a bearing on your rewards while you're there. Whether you're going to be a private, you're going to be an army. 
But are you going to be a private, a corporal, sergeant? You're going to be a general? You're going to be a corporal? You're going to be a colonel? What part will you play? For eternity. You're not going to advance when you get there. The advancement comes here. Do you understand? It's what you do here for the cross and for the kingdom. Not there. That's settled. He has a plan for you. He did it from the foundation of the world. Think God's able to do that? He has a plan. He wrote a book about you. Psalms 129. It's written down. And then he gave us this book. He said, get it, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. The other psalm is, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. That's how it works. I want to get into this a little bit tonight. This idea of faithfulness and, and faith. We're, our, our, our key scripture here is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 in the Amplified. I'm going to read it to you. With this in view, we constantly pray for you that our God may deem you and count you worthy of your calling. And his every gracious purpose of goodness towards you. And with power may complete in you every particular work of faith. Faith which is that leaning of the whole human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness in you. It's his, and he gave it to you. Three more gifts. Christ has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that cleans that all up. You're done. You should not have any consciousness of sin in your past. No consciousness of sin in your past. Because God took care of it. If you got something that's coming back to you from your past, it's because you're giving the devil place. You are complete in him. That means he's not going to do any more for you about that. It's done. Well, what? Man, I screwed up yesterday. Doesn't make any difference. That's the benefit of being a child of God. Do you understand it? Do you have children? Did you ask them that every time they screwed up, they, oh, God, give me, get you know, on their knees and beg you for forgiveness? That's what Heath sees when we do that. So what are you doing? You're one of my kids now. I know you mess up. I know you screw up. It's okay. Just work toward finding out who you are. See, when you start doing that, a lot of that other stuff starts, stop, stop, stops happening. Whatever that weakness is you struggle with, that just stops happening because you start focusing in on who you are in Christ and what he's done for you and what he's gifted you to do and all that rest of that stuff and the things of the world, they will start getting dimmer, more dim and more dim. And those condemning thoughts and those condemning things, they'll become less and less and less. And we want to talk to you about that just a little bit tonight. A revelation that God gave me this week. So if I forget about it, make sure you bring it to my attention. I love this word absolute.
It says, you put the whole personality on God, your whole human personality, you put it on God in absolute trust and confidence. I know what that's like. I've had that experience. In 1987, when I had lumps all over my body, I knew what, the, I knew what was being said to me. I knew the voice, what was saying, but it seemed to make sense. It, just, it made sense. You got this going on, all these lumps, and they're pa getting more painful all the time. I couldn't even ride in my tractor. It was so painful around my stomach and up through my chest. My arms. I know what that voice was saying. The world would have called me a fool. But you know what? I didn't ask the world. The medical practice would have said that's the stupidest thing any man could do. But you know what? I didn't ask the doctors. I didn't ask the specialists and the, and, and the drug companies. I didn't, I didn't ask them. I just went to the Word. Now, I had been into the Word, and I was meditating and praying. And things come in life as a test. You're not going any farther until you get that test taken care of. Starts with money. That's why 99% of the Christians are just Christians. They're called babies. Some of them have been saved for 50 years, 60 years, 80 years, 30 years. They're babies. They're just babies. Because if you can't, my teaching tomorrow in, 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 the, in the businessman's perspective is going to be, if you read that, that's a little bit what I talked about. But if you can't handle the mammon of righteousness, who's going to trust you with true riches? It doesn't say that about being healed. Don't say that about preaching or using your gift. Says if you can't be handled, if you can't handle money, the mammon of unrighteousness. There's no righteousness in money. It's it's it meets a need. And then he goes on and talks about the rich young ruler. And he talks about how the rich young ruler had great wealth. What kind of thoughts you had? Do you think he had going through his mind when God said? I want you to sell everything you got and give it to the poor. What, what, what do you think was going on in his mind? What was going on in your mind if, if you had a voice that spoke that to you? Would you say, could, could I get another opinion? And, and most of us just blow it off. Maybe you ate too much. We live in wants and pleasures. This country is in a real problem. But see, it isn't the ones that they're all talking about. I know that's a real problem, too. But it's much deeper than that. You know what it is? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Anybody else? Greed. Anybody else? You know what the problem is? Those, those are true. Body of Christ ain't doing their job. Anything else? Those are all absolute facts. The truths. Okay. 
You know what the problem is? We don't have God on our side. Do you understand? We don't have God on our side. Not where the country is concerned. Let me ask you something. Was Joshua and Caleb faithful? They were? Well, man, I I just read that and it's... They marched around the mountain for 40 years. That don't make any sense. Why was God punishing them? They were faithful. They were the two dudes that came back and said, oh my gosh, this is the promised land. Let's go take it. And 10 of them said, they're out of their mind. There's got to be a better place because there's giants over there. That's the United States of America. We cross the Jordan River, but we're all standing there arguing about whether we take on the giants. Well, what's giants? We're still fussing about racism. How stupid is that? How stupid. We all come from the same place. We're all from the same people. There's no difference in the Chinese and the Japanese and the the Koreans and and the Russians. We're all the same. We came from the same place. You ever heard of Adam and Eve? Do you know Abraham was an Arab? He was an Arab. He was born in the country of Iraq. Did you know that? He was a pure-blooded Arab. Born that way, grew up that way. And yet we'll get on Arabs, but we think there's some kind of a cult or something. They're just doing the thing they've always done. They just... <laughs> You know what? When they come up to the road and there's a Y that says, keep doing our religion and Jesus is over here, they just say, well, we keep doing our religion. That's all. How many of us did that? How many people that's born again and in the church have come up to a place and said, oh, we're just going to keep doing what the denomination says. We're just doing what the church says. We're just doing what this pastor says. We won't do healing and prosperity and blessing. Even though it says these signs will follow those who believe. What? You're going to go that way? That's where we're at. We're way out there somewhere, drifting around, marching around the mountain. That's the United States of America. I know all these fuzzy, warm and fuzzy preachers like to tell you stuff so you keep giving money and keep coming back. But the bottom line is, God isn't on our side. We broke the covenant. They say, oh, we're covenant. We got a covenant with God. But we broke that covenant so many times. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? You think abortion wasn't breaking a covenant? Do you really think that God's going to tolerate that? That's, that's crazy, you guys. And, yeah, we're going to go through some crap. We are, we're going to. You ain't experienced it yet, but you're going to experience it. I hope you've been out of debt. I hope you got no bills to pay, and I hope you got your life in order, and I hope you got things going on with your children and stuff. I hope you're getting God be Lord of everything you do, because you'll make it. I have a covenant with God because I'm not breaking mine. This nation does it. They've decided we're going to rule without God. They've taken God out of the, what, what, all the things that they take God out of in this last Election. I mean, Nancy Pelosi stood there and wouldn't even mention God in the Pledge of Allegiance. They took it out. Did you guys know that? They, they took God out. And we just tolerate, oh, they're Catholics. They're good Catholics. 
Biden's a good Catholic and she's a good Catholic? No, they're not good Catholics. I'm not sure what that even is, to be honest with you. I thought I did. I'm not sure what a good Baptist is. Does anybody, can you explain that to me? Or a good Methodist or a good Presbyterian? Do you guys, can you explain to me what that is? I don't know what that is. Not anymore. I thought I knew. I'm not saying I graduated. I'm just saying I look at this thing and I say, I'm not speaking doomsday. I'm just telling you. We're right on the cusp. Do you know how long? Do you know what's happened in this country in two years? What happens if that multiplies in the next two? Do you know what everybody's putting their hope in? Man, Mark, if we can just get the Republicans in there. What are they doing, sitting at their desk and going to parties? Can you tell me anything they've done? Can you explain to me? So, who do you have your faith in? Every time I hear them talking about the Republic, oh, we got to get the Republicans in there. Man, that'll just change everything. Well, I'll tell you what, it didn't change anything when Trump was in there. There's all kinds of Republicans didn't agree with what he is doing. He was tied up for three and a half years. The Republicans didn't do anything to help him out. I don't think, I, I think we don't have God on our side, guys. You know why? We may on an individual basis, like Joshua and Caleb, but the whole nation. I want to ask you something. I hear preachers all the time, oh, we got a covenant with God in this country. We had this thinking with the Mayflower. And I said, I agree with all that. That's all fine, but you've got to keep it. Let me ask you something. When the nation Israel was standing at the Jordan River and they made a decision we're not going to go in, did they have a covenant with God? Where was the covenant at? Covenant with, with, with Abraham. He was the star of the Jewish nation. He said, I'm going to call you Abram, but I'm going to start calling you Abraham because you are the first seed of this nation I want to build. They're called Jews. Do all the Jews follow the covenant? Are you getting where I'm coming from? Do all the Jews have a covenant? They're not following Abraham. I don't know what they're following. They don't know what they're following. We're talking about the Jews. Oh, but they're God's chosen people. They still have to follow the covenant. They still have to believe. They still have to walk in faith. Jesus called him faithful Abraham. Why? Because he's full of faith. Was the nation Israel full of faith? When we said, no, we're not going over there. We're going to go over here. They weren't full of faith. They didn't want nothing to do with it. They thought they were right. They thought they were righteous. They thought they were doing what was right. But they griped and complained in Egypt. They griped and complained at the Red Sea. Now they're griping and complaining at the, at the Jordan River. Is that faith? That's, you know what? I would venture to say 90% of the Christians are just like that. Gripe and complain about everything. Any kind of a trial they get into, it's just, why is God letting this happen to me? Why is God doing this? Why is God doing that? They're babies. You understand? They've never got into the meat. They've never been tested and proven. Their, their, their metal has never been heated up and pounded on and, and shaped and molded because they've never submitted themselves to that. They've never put themselves in a position where they could be 
shaped and molded and built character. Why? Because the world is providing everything they need. They got a good job at Caterpillar and they got a good job here and we're all going on strike and getting more money. Constantly looking to the world for all your needs. God doesn't say in here that as you go on strike enough times, you'll make a lot more money. He gave you a way of doing it. And you don't want to hear it. Give, and it will be given back to you. Hard measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will men give into your bosom? You can do that whether you're in business or you're working for a Ford Motor Company or you're, or you're running a, a hydro. Hoe. The principles are the same, but you have to exercise faith. You don't give begrudgingly or of necessity. You give with a cheerful heart. You give knowing that you're going to be a blessing so that God will trust you with more. That's how it works. That's how you grow. And it starts with money. If you aren't faithful with your money, I just listened to Larry Kudlow on the TV. He, he, I really like him. He was uh, some kind of a financial director for Trump. But Larry is, he's a sharp guy. If you want to put your money in something, then don't tell anybody I told you this, but you can get 10% on an iTreasury. That's a government treasury. You can get 10% on it. Okay. Enough that. I'm not a financial advisor. But I can tell you how to make money. If your heart is right, and the only way you can listen. You can listen to me to the cows come home and be wrong all the time. Because you got to get into the word and let the word change your heart. Because if your heart isn't right, all the principles I teach you are going to be going the wrong way. You're going to be doing it for the wrong reasons. You're going to have your cart in front of your horse. You got to be doing it because you know you're gifted in this area. I've helped these two young men right here a lot. I've helped a couple of others, several others. But I do it because I, I perceive in my heart they're ready, willing, and able. Because I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. I got a lot of pearls. And you can't come and take them. That's impossible. But you can have it given to you. That's possible. All that needs to happen is God to say something. I've given at one time more money than most people make in two lifetimes, or two, two years of li working, three years. But I gave it to faithful. And they proved themselves faithful. I've had people come and say, well, you know you give there, why don't you give to me? Can you believe somebody come up and ask me that? Bad decision. Because, see, I not only am very kind and gentle and loving and caring, I, I can be very wrathful. Do you understand? And I'm good at both. Absolute. Are you absolute in trusting and confidence, in trusting in the confidence in his power? Are you absolute? Are you absolute? This is scripture. Are you absolute in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness? Are you absolute beyond the shadow of a doubt? I believe it. So if God spoke to you and said, I want you to take half your wealth and just give it to this ministry that you've been following, 
Would you do it? People say, I know there's a, a lady that I went to school with. And uh, her father had a very, very well-known business in this town called the Powell Company. Made a lot of money and lived in a, probably the nicest home in Delphus, or at least one of them, on Fifth Street, near the grade school. Those big, beautiful brick two stories. I don't know if there, I don't think there's this tore down because I think it's what what is it Brett what what are the what are the streets beside the grade school one of them is is it no nah, I keep saying Braddock that's way west that's way west Pierce and Franklin okay Pierce you go you go to the east of Pierce. One of them quartered my brother at the, fam at, at, the, at the school reunion. I said, your dad must have left you guys a lot of money. Mike says, well, why is that? Well, the place your brother lives at, it's like it. He, sh he couldn't have earned that kind of money. There's no way. Do you think this person's ever run a business? Do you think this person's ever struggled? No, their dad did. So they under don't understand it. See, God wants you to understand wealth. And he'll give you more. He'll do it. He doesn't care what you did. He don't care how retired you are or how unretired you are. He didn't care anything about any of that. That don't mean there's nothing in heaven written about retirement or unretirement. Did you know that? Because if it was, it'd be in this book. So that, that isn't an issue with God. And he doesn't care about how old you are. He doesn't care about how young you are. He just cares, are you going to walk in the simplicity of his word? See, that's the big argument about sovereignty. I, I said God isn't sovereign. And of course, I, that offends some people, and that's okay. I don't care. But bottom line is, God is sovereign in his word, but he can't make this word work in your life. He has limitations. He, he is not able to do anything he wants. He didn't want, do you think he wanted a nation Israel to walk around Mount Sinai for 40 years? You guys think he did one of that? What was his plan? Huh? What, what, what was God's plan? Get your rear end across that river and go in there and whack those guys. I'm taking care of it. But see, they didn't see things that way because they didn't believe this scripture right here that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This scripture has never changed, not from the beginning of time to this moment. It still is true that absolute trust and confidence in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness is what God is trying to get across to his church. The same way he was trying to get across to Israel. They walked around the mountain, and that's where we're headed. Oh, so there's millions of us Christians in here. Yeah, millions of them, the babies. What kind of an army are they? Most of them don't even know Ephesians chapter 6, put on the full armor of God. They say, oh, yeah, isn't that wonderful? Well, what does it mean? Well, I don't know what it means. Put on the full armor of God, what the heck is that? They got it memorized or something. They may be able to quote it, but they have no clue what it means. You know why? They've never, what'd you just say, Billy? What was that, how, that phrase you just said? Tested or tested their, tested their hearts. Is it baby? Is it on meat? I've gone through three major recessions in my life and didn't even know they were there. You know why? 
I wasn't watching television. I wasn't listening to the radio. I wasn't paying attention to that. You know what I was doing? I was just getting it. I was just in the Word. I said, sir, my, my trust and my faith is in what you said. I know what the world's saying. I know who can heal me. I know who did heal me. Man, you hear these guys, oh, my gosh, you need to have this and you need to have this. You ever heard of this thing called relief factor? Oh, my gosh, it's going to get rid of your pain. And, and the very same people that are selling it are saying, you know, they want you to get, they want you to get caught up into the farm, pharmacia. They want you to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. Do you think they have an interest in you being healthy? But why do you keep going to them? Well, you got to do that. Who told you you had to do that? Who told you you had to go to the doctor? It's just all the crap you've learned since you were a baby. I'm telling you there's a better way. Why would you want to get caught up into that? Isn't that a curse to have all your money going to something else? That's one of the curses in life. Did you know that? That your wealth goes to the stranger. How about doctors and lawyers and insurance companies? And how about, how about all that stuff? Oh, geez. Oh. I guess you guys don't need to know where I stand, do you? It's frustrating. I feel like I'm pushing a rope. You know, I've only got between what? We got between 12 and 20 people showing up on a regular basis. But see, this is, this is the cave of Adalim. You guys, do you know that? You guys, most of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Do you know what the cave of Adalim is? It's a cave that David stayed in. How stupid can he be? You're supposed to be the king? You know how long he did that? Like 15 years, 16 years. You know what he was doing in there? Waiting for all the scums of society and all the humdrums and the hobos and people didn't have nothing to do. Outcasts. They weren't welcome in Saul's army. He was waiting until God brought those people in. He ended up with 400 of them. Did you know that? You know what he was doing? Training. You know what Steve Doyle's doing? Training. 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 Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God. These people that walk in here have no clue what's going on here. They just have no idea. And they just they get driven and tossed with the wind. If the wind blows north, they just go north. If it goes south, every... Oh, yeah, I got that. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. I'll get that problem taken care of. Yeah, so, and, and they just, every, every slightest little thing, they just go that way. It's always no reason. And tell me where another cave of Adalim that you can go to in this area. I don't care if you believe it or not. Don't make me no difference. If you don't believe it, you don't even, you don't really even need to be here. I'd rather teach one person that's faithful and dedicated because I can really do something with them. Is that true, boys? Caleb? I see lives changing, and I don't care how many. So don't get bogged down with numbers. Don't even talk to me about it. I don't care. I'm building an army in a cave, and I'm not exactly sure what we're going to go whack, but we're going to whack something. Now, we've done a little bit of whacking, but not nothing like we're going to. You understand? We're building an army. I know there's a lot of stuff going on out here. Some of it's good. Some of it's not so good. 
But if you don't build people in the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have nothing. You just have the nation Israel walking around the mountain. You've got to teach people. You've got to teach the children. You've got to get them baptized in the Holy Spirit. You think children can speak in tongues? That's where the power is. Do you understand? The power isn't going to church. Lord knows we have all, all know plenty of people who do that and don't know nothing. Ask Dennis. He's in Europe. He's living large. But bottom line is, I fought my fights. I, I, I killed the lion, I killed the bear, and I whacked the giant. And many years have passed, and I still continue to do it. But one day the Lord said, I want you to start training. I said, okay. I didn't understand it all. I still don't. But God told me to don't trust in myself. Don't worry about it. Don't lean to your understanding. If you're going to do something for God and you're always leaning on your understanding, you're in total violation of this scripture right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. You are not absolutely, unequivocally sold out to God's trust, confidence, power, wisdom, and goodness. He'll never leave you, nor forsake you. He'll be with you till the end of the age. So that's one thing you can take with you when you walk out of here. You can always be thinking about, he's with you. He gave everybody that much. But most have forgot about their covenant. The church in the United States of America. Look, it takes more than 30%. Because if you don't get the right people in, you're going to get a lot of bad decisions and you're going to get them really fast and bad. Just like we've experienced for two years. They're the blind leading the blind because they do not have God in their covenant. Their leaders and they will be held accountable. I once heard Kenneth Hagin, who started Raymond Bible Training Center, he once said that whatever problems happen in America, it's a Christian's fault. Because this is what we got. Right here. Do it on an individual basis. Let God prove himself to you. You know what that builds? One of the five words here. Confidence. You'll do more. And you'll do a little bit more. And God will satisfy you. And then with long life, he will satisfy you and show you his salvation. You want long life? You know what long life is? What does the world say life is? Long life. It's 80, what, 80 for a man or something like that, and like 83 for a woman. You know what the Bible says? 120. What are we listening to? What bill of goods are we buying? What voices are you listening to? When you hear a voice from the world, if you don't have the word of God in your heart, you won't refute it. Now I'm going to teach you something here tonight. I'm going to have to get going in that. Absolute, I want to finish this, means free, independent of anything outside of God. Free and independent from 
anything outside of God. That's absolute. Hence, complete in itself, positive, unconditional, independence, independent of any other cause. In other words, if God said, by his stripes you're healed, there's no other cause that you can put in front of that. That's absolute. Well, don't you understand? I have pain. I don't care what you got. Don't make me no difference about your pain. You want, you, you want to take relief factor for the rest of your life? Or whatever that stuff is? And oh, they just think that's so wonderful. But you know what? Boys, I've never had a headache. Do you understand? Do you understand the significance of that? I've never taken an aspirin. Yeah, God can do that. Whose mind has stayed on him? I'm not trying to put condemnation on you. I'm simply trying to motivate you. Do you understand the difference? You don't like that? Then do something about it. Don't stand at the Jordan River saying we're not going over there. We're not going to go do that. That's crazy. There's giants and all kinds of stuff over there that we can lose our life, man. No. God says you're going to lose your life if you don't go over there. And they just like, see, out of his mind. Of course, they blame the leaders, Moses and Joshua and Caleb, because they just didn't think they were hearing from God because what they believed was much better than what they're saying. Yet they were the same ones that griped and complained all the time. Why did you bring us out here to die in this wilderness? I can't believe you did this. Oh my gosh, we got it. We're in trouble, man. Look at this. Here comes the Egyptians, man. They got their chariots. We're all going to die. That's, that was a, a voice of faith, wasn't it? You do the same thing. I got this pain going on here, and I just read this report about this thing that if this goes on in my heart and this goes on, you probably got this thing, and it's probably this thing. Well, I'm going to give you some real information about that tonight. Praise the Lord. Here's another one. Faithful in what you do. God has given you authority in this life. You don't need it up there. He's given you authority. What does this authority look like? It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants. Mark 13, 34 in the New King James Version. Who left his house and he gave authority to his servants. And to each his work, his task, his responsibility, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. In other words, the doorkeeper controlled the, the city or the place where the fort or whatever they had, and he, he, he was watching to keep an eye on what's going on here. Well, these men had a task. They each had a task and a responsibility. He gave them authority to run his business. And then he left. He went to a far country. But he gave authority. Did he have it to give? He had it to give. Now you know why God's not, not sovereign. He's sovereign in his word because he watches over it to perform it. You see what I'm saying? That's why you got to get in the word. And then you got to apply it to your life. But if you're going to expect him just to do something for you, because he's sovereign. That's what I hear all the time. Oh, God's sovereign. He's going, he, you know, what will be, will be. Whatever happens to us, that's just the way it's supposed to be. That's how a lot of Christians think it, because God's sovereign. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. Has nothing to do with us. I've heard him say it. I said, it does have something to do with you. He gave you authority. 
And he went through a far country. It's called the right hand of the Father. And he gave authority to man. I'm going to read you what authority is. Authority is legal power. A right to command or act. You command. What did the centurion say to Jesus? I'm a man under authority. I have authority. I'm, a, I'm like a colonel in the Roman army. I know what authority is like. I tell this man to go that way and this man to go that way, and he does it. You know what happens if he don't? He be gone. So all you need to do, Jesus, because I've seen authority in you. I've seen what you did. I heard what you did. All you need to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. That's all. That's authority. But you have to believe. Like the century. You have to believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He's not talking about you're getting it. He's talking about you finding out what's inside of you. Do you understand that? When you meditate this word, your mind changes. You're renewing your mind and proving that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're reading and changing your mind to be like God. And as you get to be more like God and more like God, you become a man with authority. You have it. You've got it. It's inside of you. The authority is in the Holy Spirit, creator of the universe, creator of everything. You have it, but you aren't using it because you don't understand it. You don't believe it. You don't exercise it. And if you did, you wouldn't believe it anyways. He gave us authority on this earth. You see how the church is thrown it away with this government? They, I, I tell you, probably half the Christians I know voted for Biden. You know, the very least you ought to be doing is voting for morality. That's the very least you ought to do. I've had so many of them say, well, I didn't know who to vote for, you know. I, just didn't want, I didn't want either one of them. I said, well, did you maybe choose the best of the two? They don't want to talk about that. And 9% nine, 9 of them who'd want to do what they don't want anyways. They don't believe nothing. And they're Christians. Authority, legal power, a right to command, a right to command. Does God say, say to the mountain? Is that authority? Is that authority? A right to command. That's authority. Or act. Ever thought about your step of faith? That's an act. You're going to do something that's bigger than you are? That's an act. That's an act. A right to command or act. The power derived from respect or esteem. Do you really respect the Holy Spirit? Do you esteem him? Don't call it a net. He's not a net. He's a person. Do you respect him? Do you, do you esteem him? You hold him high. Is he higher than yourself? Is he higher than your wife? Is he higher than your friends? Is he higher than the government? Whatever we got going on in this nation, you don't have to be a part of it. Do you understand? You don't have to be a part of it. But you're not going to get there with your power. 
and your authority because you know what? You learned a long time ago you ain't got none. You ain't got daily squat. All you got power and authority to do is get yourself in trouble. That's all you got power and authority to do. You'll be in trouble all the time. And trouble was more than going out and robbing a bank. Trouble was thinking the wrong thing when you're driving down the highway. Well, you know what? So-and-so died on the highway last week because they had this situation and that situation. And, you know, and so you think about it and you, instead of dealing with it, you just keep on driving and forget about it. And when one of those days, you're going to have it. I'm going to show it to you. Why does God tell you to cast down every thought and imagination? Why does he tell you to do that? Because he wants to keep you busy? The power derived from respect and esteem, weight of character, respectability, dignity, order or permission, the persons or the body exercising power or command, by what authority dost thou do these things? Acts 9.14. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what the Lord said to me. I'm going to tell you because it's time. You guys got your shouting clothes on? I'm going to teach you something. More than what I have been. I hope you guys are sitting on the edge of your seat. This is what the Lord said to me. Part of authority is permission. I was watching the movie, it's been a while, a long time ago. I like Denzel Washington. He's a Christian man, and uh, he, he has some good stuff. I, he's been in some raunchy stuff, too, but you know, I don't know when it's born again day-wise. And I think the name of the movie was Equalizer. I shared this with Caleb earlier today in, in person. And he was an ex-CIA operative. He, could go, he was trained and he could go into things and do things that nobody, very few people can do. Kind of like a naval, Navy SEAL on steroids. And he got out of that and just wanted to start helping people. He had some people in his neighborhood. Uh, there was a, a young black man that was, was seeing himself worthless and he was trying to build his life up, build his character up, get him to believe in himself. Get him to see God in him and not so much what all the people have told him and all the lies that he'd been hearing all of his life. And then he had another one. And so he, he got a job at Home Depot. And he had several young men and women. Uh, most of them, all, I think all of them were minority, uh, you know, Mexican. And, and, and he's trying to get them to believe in themselves. Well, one of the young girls, probably 18 to 20, he's trying to help her because she was depressed, discouraged all the time. You know, yada, yada. The Russian mafia got a hold of her and snatched her. He said to the guys that were working at home, Where, where's Elena at? They said, well, I don't know. Well, time passed and they found out she was kidnapped. You know, the sexual sex trade? Which I guess it's staggering in this country. It's like, thank you, Lord, for blinding me. I don't know nothing about it, but they say it's running rampant. Children being stolen. The lady just gave a testimony. She said, I was pushing my children in a, in a grocery cart. And she, oh, I forgot that one thing on the other aisle. So she had a three-year-old in her cart or four-year-old in her cart. Okay. I ran over real quick to the other eye. When she came back, the baby was gone. 
happening everywhere. What do you think God said? There are no plague. Excuse me while I turn the Harley off. What do you think God gives you those promises? Do you think he wants you to live with that fear? No plague will come nigh your dwelling. He talks about how you walk in wisdom. Does he, did he not tell you that he, gave, he, he, he became to you righteousness, sanctification, wisdom, redemption? Did he not say that? What do you think he said those things for? He's trying to protect you from all this garbage. Financial problems, you name it. Sickness, disease, and we think it's okay because we have insurance. Well, one day it won't be okay, dude, because you're going to have something that you can't fix. Help yourself with your insurance. But anyways, the Russian mafia. And he was starting to get engaged with them, and they were finding out about him. And they were saying, this guy ain't normal. The things he's doing, they're not normal. Because he was killing these Russian guys as he would find them. And he, and he got this girl, and he got her out. And the guys, most of them lost their life. Russian mafia. And I can tell you from my daughter's words, they're the worst in the nation. The Italian mafia don't even exist anymore, are they? The Russian mafia. But they're heartless. But I'm not going to go there. So, he was trying to find out who the leaders were of this thing. And of course, as he began to lurch, he was beginning to find out some of the people. And so, he called up his old boss. It was a lady. And he met her out on her estate, out in the East Coast somewhere. And he's sitting there, and of course, he could see the horses and, and everything. And here comes a helicopter flying in, and it lands on, on this property. And he's sitting there with the guy. The guy's been retired. The lady gets out of the helicopter and walks up, and he starts talking to him. And they said, hey, so-and-so, you know, I was calling him Denzel. That wasn't his name, but hey, Denzel, how you doing? Man, it's been a long time. I haven't seen you for a long time. We you stay for supper? He said, yeah, I'll stay for supper. They stayed for supper, you know, and then they had a conversation. And I don't know what the husband did, but he was a very successful man. I think he was an attorney. And anyways, then finally said, well, I've got to go. And the husband came to the wife, who was the CIA person, since retired, but still has a connection. And the husband says to the wife, he said, uh, he's needing your help, isn't he? And she says, no, he doesn't need our help. He was just asking for permission. Because she had control of the CIA and he was going to start taking these guys out. He asked for permission without asking for it. And the Lord spoke to me one day, just this week. He said, Son, do you know you're all powerful? You have all authority? I've given it to you. When I left here, I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. And I'm making sure this word gets performed exactly like it's written. I'm not coming down there and doing things. That's your job. All power and all authority has been given to me, and I give it to you. That's what the cross is for. And I said, man, God, if we got that power and authority, I, I, that's phenomenal. He said, son, you have it for everything. You have power and authority over sin. You have it. It, can't, it can't bother you anymore. You have authority over it. You have power and authority over sickness and disease. You have power and authority over poverty. You have power and authority over 
problems in your family. You have power and authority over it all. I said, man, that really puts us in an amazing place, God. And then he said this to me. He said, son, do you know that when the devil comes to you and he speaks to you, and he says, you're dying of a heart attack, you, you got this problem, you got that problem, these people don't like you, you're going to fail in your business, this ain't going to work, that ain't going to work. How many negative things have you had going through your mind today? You know where those things come from? Your adversary, the devil. Do you know what he's doing? He's asking for permission. You got that pain over here? Probably going to have a heart attack. What's he waiting for? Permission. And he's going to take you out. But you've got to give him permission because all power and all authority has been given to you. And you don't know it. That's why peop my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And he comes and he whispers to you and he says things to you just like he did Jesus. He's asking for permission because you don't even know you have authority over him, but he does. And if he tells you something and that thing you know it's coming out of your mouth, the power of life and death is in your tongue. And it's coming out of your mouth and it's getting into the world and you are giving him permission. And he's going to take you out. You've given him permission. It may not happen right away. You say, you scared me to death and you died. It wouldn't be long. We'd get it, wouldn't we? But we'd say it 5, 10, 15, 20 times, 100 times, whatever. And all of a sudden, you lost a child. You had an accident. You had some other kind of financial setback. You got, you got, had a problem in your marriage. You had a problem in your children. All because the devil is asking you for permission because he does not have any authority over you. God gave it to you. He doesn't have any. Except deception. That's all he has. He has nothing else. But he's a thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Because he deceives you into giving him authority. You give him permission. That was a revelation to me. I said, man, where in the world have we been? We bought into every single piece of crap we've listened to all of our lives. Our great-grandparents gave permission to him. Our grandparents gave him permission. Our parents gave him permission. And we ain't doing it no more. Not this group. This is a new day. This is a new dawn. This is reality. I know now why he gave us the power to cast thoughts down. He says, don't take the thought saying. Doesn't he say that? Don't take the thought saying. Why? You're giving the devil permission to be what he's created to be, a thief. To kill, steal, and destroy. It doesn't have to happen to you. Because you simply say, I know I did a teaching over in the, the room over there. When you got some voice speaking to you and it's not lining up with what you believe, no. Not today. Not on my watch. No evil is going to befall me. I don't, did anybody in our group get COVID? You guys ever thought about that? That's kind of strange, isn't it? I 
I don't know if anybody did. I don't know that did. Pretty good percentage. If it's not perfect, it's close. Well, you think that's just the luck of the draw? You may even not even believe what you hear. But if you hear it, it's in here. You may not exercise the, the offensive part of it. Because you can be offensive with it. I don't mean offensive like you're, you're a jerk. I'm talking about offensive as in a warrior in battle. You can take the devil out. One life at a time, that's all. God doesn't ask any more of you. Some men are evangelists, and they would be required a little bit more. To whom much is given, much is required. When he asks you for permission, you tell him no. You don't have permission in this family. Well, you know it's going around. It doesn't make any difference. You don't have permission to give my children and grandchildren COVID or anything else. I'm not giving you permission. The Bible says you have many teachers, but you have very few fathers. I'm one of your fathers. Now you can walk away and go be the prodigal son. I'm going to keep taking care of business. You can always know I'm here. That's what the word says. You have many teachers, but you have very little fathers. Paul was saying that. He's trying to show these people that he had taught. You know, there were seven churches in Laodicea. One of them was the church of Laodicea. There were seven churches in that area of Iran. They're all dead and gone because he didn't listen to them. He wouldn't let him be a father to them. He let them be a teacher, but he wouldn't let him be a father. See, a father is more important than a teacher. A father is someone that takes a real keen interest. You do that to your children, Mark? Yes, sir. You know, you got a little baby Colin. Or, uh, yeah. Huh? Two of them. Two of them, yeah. I was just thinking. See, you got two boys and a, a girl, right? It's your choice. You're the establishing authority in that family. What are you going to let that? What are you going to let come in there? You're going to give him devil permission, or are you going to use the authority that God gave you? I know you're not going to feel like you got any authority. I'm not talking about your feelings. Your feelings will deceive you and let you down every time. You go by your feelings, you're always going to be making a wrong decision. Always. I get people so frustrated with me. It's like, why don't you make a decision and let's move on? Because I said I haven't got the answer yet. How long did I wait to get this floor down, Mark? Until you had the answer. <laughs> Until I had the answer. Wow. I think we waited eight months. Let's take communion with a new perspective. Realizing the power and authority that God put in us. That's his body we're taking. Did he have power and authority? What do you think he's asking us to take communion? He's trying to get us to realize the power and authority that's in us. It's not just a a church act. It's not playing cornhole, cornhole or whatever they call that. 
not a game. He has a purpose. Do you have him in mind all day long, all week long? I just got done reading you some of those definitions and some of that power. Authority. The church. You can control your destiny with the power of God. It's in you. But you got to know what's in you. That is your responsibility and mine. But I can't do what you guys do. I can't do for you. I can father you. I can give you direction. And I've told some of you guys, you come to me and you ask me a question. I said, that's a, that's a total wrong thing. That's what a father does. Those children are really important. Huge. They are to me. See, I don't care how many come here. I'm just, I'm just doing my best to build an army because I don't know what God wants us to do. But he ain't asking us to do this for, because. And look at the times we're in. Look what's happened in these two years that we've done this. Look at the mess we've gotten into. You think there isn't a purpose? What a disaster this country has had in two years. or actually a year and a half. I'm thankful for each one of you. Some of you grabbed a hold of the thing, and some of you are participating, and some of you are getting involved, and some of you are finding your gift, and some of you are doing, uh, are, are exercising your faith. But remember, faith isn't the key. Remember I said that last week? Faith is not the key. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. It's love gives you the compassion to go do something because your purpose is not to see how big of a car you can drive or how many vacations you can take. Compassion drives you to go do something because God asks you to do that because he's given you power and authority and he's invested a huge amount of things on you, called his life. And I'm giving my life here. Nothing like he did. But time is your life. God wants us to be like him. He wants us to talk like him. He wants you to think like him. He wants you to act like him. He wants you to do the things he does. He wants you to say the things he says. And he wants you to be victorious. And that's the only way you're going to get there. Because if, unless I misunderstand it, love never fails. And God is love. Faith isn't worth nothing but a clinging gong and a noisy symbol if you don't do it with love. Compassion. Why are you doing what you're doing? What are you devoting your time and your efforts toward? There's nothing wrong with being motivated and, and, and wanting to build wealth and build things, but your motivation should always be to what can I do for God? What is he saying to me? What is he asking me to do? But he'll never ask you to do something without empowering you, giving you the wisdom, and providing you the provision. Never. He provided the provision for this. I thought I was going to rent all this property. Next thing you know, I'm moving my offices over here, and I'm building this as a ministry room. That's not what I started out to do. But he made the provision. So when I was done doing it, everything was paid for. Everything. 
But it wouldn't have been if I hadn't stepped out and started doing it. Because it didn't make any sense to me. I mean, I had three people in my class up there in my room up in the other building. You think I had a vision of having a ministry room here? We've had parties in here. We're going to have a lot more of them. We're going to have a lot more fellowship. We're going to have a place where we can come together and become more like brothers. Because if I'm your father, then you guys are brothers. I don't care if you're older than I am. I'm not talking about physical. You guys don't need physical fathers. You all had one. <laughs> Some of them are gone. <laughs> what you need is spiritual fathers. And that's what Paul was trying to say to this church at Laodicea. And they didn't listen, and it's gone. Not a single church, the seven churches, are, are, are around anymore. They didn't listen. Do you think all the churches are listening out here? Okay, I'm not going to keep going here. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I praise you and thank you for these men. Sure, I hope I've said things that fully represent you and the kingdom. And I, I, I believe that I've said things, Father, that you've asked me to say that it will change their lives to be like you. I don't want them to be like me, sir. I want them to be like Jesus. And if they see any of that in me, then they can grab a hold of that. But that's all. But I give you praise. I give you glory, sir, for what you're doing in these men, for your protection during COVID. Two years of it. Pretty awesome. I just thought about that this week. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. And, sir, as we take communion, may it be a new special perspective of we are, have you inside of us, and we do not have to give the devil any permission anymore. It's over. We have power. We have authority over him. He's nothing but a fallen angel. He hasn't got a belly button. He's, he's gone. He's just not having a place in us. And Lord, as you told me, you resist him long enough, he will not bother you anymore. Eventually go away. You know where he's going? He's going to go to somebody who will listen to him, who will give him permission. And you've been giving him permission and things in your life, all your life, and you've got to stop it. And you just tell him no, and it won't be long. He'll get discouraged because he, he can get discouraged. Did you know that? Every evil thing that you read in the Bible, they can get it. And they will, they will flee. I don't know how much time that takes, but they will flee. And they'll not hassle you anymore. Sir, we give you praise and thanks for it, sir, in Jesus' name. Amen.